and welcome to the Pasco Community Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're able to join us this morning here as we worship God. We've been meeting together now for a little while this morning, and we've been singing God's praises. We've actually sung some Christmas carols. We're just worshiping the Lord and enjoying the fellowship of God's people, and we're so glad that you're able to join us at this time. And so, before we get into the preaching, which is uh, coming up pretty quick here, uh, we're going to have some special music. And we're going to ask Carol Boudelier to come and sing for us this morning. All right, if you take your Bibles, please, this morning, and thank you, Carol, for that special uh, music. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah and chapter 9. 
And while you're turning there, let's go ahead and pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for giving us another opportunity to look into your word. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts from the scriptures this morning. And as a result of this message, I pray that you'd help us to appreciate a little more all that the Lord Jesus has done for us. And so guide us and direct us through the work of your Holy Spirit and help us all to be open uh, to your voice today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many here this morning know what their name means? Anybody know what their name means? I, I, I think I remember the, the Millers sharing with us on a Sunday night testimony something about what their names uh, mean. Uh, I went this week and I looked up my name to see what it meant. And I found out that the word Brian means strong. It's an old English word for strong. And I found out that Keith, which is my middle name, uh, uh, that, that Keith was the surname of a long line of Scottish nobility. And it comes from an old Scottish word that means wood. And Speroni, well, that's Italian. It means someone who's good with a spear. And, um, and so basically my name means that I'm, I'm uh, strong when it comes to throwing a wooden spear. And, uh, and so I got to thinking this week, well, maybe I missed my calling. Maybe I should have been a javelin thrower in the Olympics instead of a, a, a preacher. But uh, I have a suspicion that my Olympic hopes are pretty much over at this point. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, I really don't think I was named after Scottish royalty or, or because I was strong, I have a suspicion I was actually named after the actor Brian Keith. I think that's probably who I was, uh, was named after. But how about you? How about your name? Were you named after someone special? Were you named after something special? Or was it like your parents just, uh, you know, threw a bunch of names in a hat and drew one out? Huh? What, what does your name mean? And I know there are some pretty interesting and strange names uh, out there. Does anybody remember an old rocker named Frank Zappa? From uh, He died back in, I think, 1993, died young at 52. But in the late 60s, he had two children, a boy and a girl. He named that boy Dweezil, and he named that girl Moon Unit. I thought, yep, that's some strange names right there. But what we're going to do for the next four weeks, we're going to look at some very interesting names. And all of these names point to one person, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the one with the name above all names. Now, there are hundreds of names for Jesus in the scriptures that describe who he is. Lord of hosts, deliverer, king of kings, redeemer, uh, savior. But because it's Christmas time, I'd like us to reflect on four of his names as they're found in a famous Christmas passage. So if you got your Bible open to Isaiah chapter 9, look at verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder." And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is a, a, a great passage of scripture because it not only predicts the Messiah's birth 600 years before it ever happened, but it also describes how incredible he is. But before we look at the names of Jesus, we need to consider the question, what's in a name? What's in a name? I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard the saying, a picture paints a thousand words. Well, in the scriptures, a name paints a thousand words. Uh, in, in the Bible, a person's name often described who, or who he or she was. That, you know, that person's character or their, their personality. And the name Jesus means Jehovah saves, or Jehovah is a salvation. 
And Jehovah means the eternal one, the everlasting one, the all-encompassing one. You might remember when God called Moses uh, to go back to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel from bondage, Moses had a conversation with God about it. It's recorded in the book of Exodus chapter 3. And in verses 13 and 14 of that chapter, it says this, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And he is the I am. That is, he is, he was, and he will always be. He is the everlasting, all-encompassing uh, one. That's what Jehovah means. And because God's name describes who he is, his name is revered throughout the scriptures. In Psalm 29, 2, we read, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And let me just clue you in on something, that when you're reading through your Old Testament and you come across the word Lord, when it is all in capital letters, that means it's the Hebrew word Jehovah. So keep that in mind. Give, give unto the Lord, give unto Jehovah the glory due unto his name. In Psalm 34, verse 3, it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And in Psalm 111, verse 9, it says, Holy and reverend is his name. And so the name Jehovah in the Old Testament was revered and exalted. And in the New Testament, the same thing is true about the name Jesus. The same thing. Why? It's because the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. They are one and the same. And so Jesus' name is the most powerful name ever. In Philippians 2.10, it says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that name is so powerful, so powerful, that in Acts 4.12, we read this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so the name of Jesus is powerful and life changing. And when we look at the names of Christ, we look at the person of Christ. Understanding his name helps us to better understand him. And so this morning, we're going to consider the names Wonderful and Counselor. And the first thing that I want you to think about this morning is the wonder of his name. The wonder of his name. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful. And wonderful means things like marvelous, exceptional, and incredibly great. But Webster's thesaurus gives us three other synonyms for the word wonderful that I think are so appropriate. Uh, the first synonym uh, is the word amazing. And his name is amazing. He is amazing. In uh, Matthew 12, 23, it says, And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? He, uh, he amazed people. And, and throughout the Gospels, the people were continually amazed by his miracles, by his teachings, by his character. His name is wonderful because he is amazing. Amazing. 
And then another synonym for uh, the word uh, wonderful is awesome. Awesome. As we said earlier, his name means Jehovah saves. What, a, what an awesome and wonderful thought that is. You know, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, it says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, uh, among the gods? Who, who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness? And then it says, fearful in praises. And that word fearful is the word awesome. That's what it means. He's fearful. He's awesome in praises. And then it says, uh, not only is he glorious in holiness, fearful in uh, praises, uh, and doing wonders, doing wonders. And as I said, Psalm 111, 9 says, holy and reverend in his name. And the word reverend there is the same exact Hebrew word for the word fearful. They both mean the same thing. They mean he is awesome. Our God is an awesome God. No doubt about that whatsoever. So uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus' name is amazing. Jesus' name is awesome. And then here's the third uh, synonym, and that is astonishing. Astonishing. His name is overwhelming. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished, astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not at the scribes. The people uh, were, were astonished at the person and work of Jesus Christ. Everything about him is wonderful. He is amazing. He is awesome. He is astounding. And no other name but the name of Jesus is worthy of glory and worthy of honor and worthy of worship and worthy of exaltation and worthy of praise. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 12, we have recorded for us the great song of heaven. And it says, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive uh, riches and, and power and glory and wisdom and blessing. He is wonderful. He is worthy of praise. And so we, we see here the wonder of his name. Now, the next thing I want you to consider is this. And I find it interesting. When, when, we, when we put the word wonderful together with the word counselor, we discover an even greater thing about him. So the second thing I want you to consider is not just the wonder of his name, but consider the wisdom of his name. Notice here it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Counselor. Now, I chose the word wisdom, talking about the wisdom of his name, because it's a key word to help us understand his role as counselor. There's a prophecy about Christ written by uh, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 11, 11 verse 2 that says this. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> and then in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, it says this, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and and understanding. He is the ultimate counselor. Now, the literal definition of the word counsel implies one who comes alongside of another. A counselor is someone who comes alongside to give knowledge and understanding. And so let me share with you two synonyms that best describe Jesus as counselor. First of all, he is our advisor, 
our advisor. He counsels us. He advises us what's right and what's wrong through his word and through his spirit. And when we need advice, he's always there to give the right advice all the time. And he's always available to encourage and comfort and guide us. David said this in Psalm 16, verse 7. He said, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My, my reins also instruct me in the night uh, seasons. You know, there's an incredible market today in counseling. Uh, psychology and, and psychiatry are major professions because people are looking for counsel, right? And many people even foolishly uh, seek out astrologers and psychics for counsel and advice. But let me give you some real help this morning by reminding you that Jesus is the perfect counselor, the perfect counselor. And he has all the right answers all the time. And what's more, he gives free advice. He gives free advice. So why, why wouldn't we go to him first <clears throat> for counsel and wisdom? In the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 5, it says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And in uh, 2 Peter 1, 3, it says, according to his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. And if this is true, and it is, then the question for us as believers is this. Do we go to him first or last for advice and counsel? And the answer to that question makes a major difference in the way you live your life. See, when the scriptures refer to Jesus as wonderful and counselor, it doesn't just mean that he's good at giving advice. It means that he understands things which are beyond the ability of our finite minds to comprehend. He knows things which, God, which only God can know. He knows the ways of God. He understands God's plan and, and purposes. His knowledge and intelligence and wisdom and intellect far exceed that of any man who ever lived. And that's because he is God. And so in Jesus Christ, we have someone who by virtue of his great knowledge and understanding is abundantly qualified to give uh, guidance and direction to our lives, someone who never is confused or mistaken, someone who always knows exactly what to do, someone who will never lead us astray. So when we need advice and counsel, our first choice needs to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about these words from the great old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. He is our advisor. That's one of his roles as counselor. And so we need to be seeking his advice. Now, another way to describe Jesus as counselor is not just as our advisor, but also as our advocate. He's our defender, our supporter, in a sense, our lawyer. You know, lawyers, even to this day, are often referred to as counselor, right? And so, remember, a lawyer's job is to interpret the law in such a way as to benefit his or her client. And lawyers pass the bar when they can demonstrate the knowledge of the law. Well, guess what? When it comes to the law of the word of God, Jesus wrote the law. Jesus wrote the law. He knows more than any, anyone uh, what's in the law. 
And what's more, he's proven that he is willing to face death in order to benefit his uh, client. That means Jesus Christ is the world's best counselor. He is our advocate. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That means one who speaks to the Father in our defense. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our advocate. And let me illustrate it this way. Suppose you committed a brutal murder and were arrested for it. And you were sent to jail and had no money to afford a lawyer, so one was appointed for you. And you found out that he's the best there is. Well, your trial comes, and the evidence is overwhelming. You're convicted and sentenced to death. Then something bizarre happens. Your lawyer stands and approaches the bench. He tells the judge that even though you're guilty, he would like to take your place in the electric chair. Well, what would you think about that lawyer? You'd be perplexed. You'd be amazed. You'd be grateful. Well, you know what? That's exactly what Jesus Christ has already done for you and me on the cross. Every one of us had sinned against God. And the penalty for sin is death. And Jesus, as our counselor, as our advocate, has taken our place on the cross. Jesus has defended us to the death. His name is Counselor. He is our advisor, and he is our advocate. Now, as we finish up the message this morning, I want us to return to that thought of him being our advisor. Because if this is true, if Jesus is our wonderful counselor, and he is, then we need to know how he counsels us, how we go about receiving the counsel that he has for us. So how does he do it? Well, let me give you the answer. Four ways that he counsels us, and we'll finish up this morning. First of all, he counsels us through prayer. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, we read, Be careful for nothing. That is, don't worry about things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so he counsels us and encourages us and advises us through uh, prayer, which is an important reason why we need to pray and why we need to put big emphasis on spending some time in prayer every single day. It's important because he counsels us through prayer. And then the second way he counsels us is through his spirit, through his spirit. When Jesus returned to heaven, he sent his spirit to continue his work. In John chapter 14, verse 16, uh, verse 26, rather, it says this. But the comforter, and let me just stop there and say that in the Greek in which our Bible was originally written, that was the word paraclete for comforter, which means one who is called alongside to help, which, by the way, is the exact definition of the word counselor. And so, uh, uh, but it says, but the comforter or the counselor, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things uh, to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And then Romans 8, 26 says this, the spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So God's spirit comes alongside our spirit to advise us and to be our advocate. And what's more, the spirit lives in us. If we've received Christ as our savior, 
The Spirit lives in us. So he's always there to support us and to encourage us and to uh, counsel us. We have the world's best counselor on permanent retainer. And so uh, Jesus counsels us through prayer. He counsels us through his spirit. And then number three, he counsels us through his word. God speaks to us through the scriptures. And all good counsel conforms to his word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we're told uh, what the scriptures are for. It begins by saying all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means this Bible is the word of God. It's the word of God. And then it says, not only does it say all scripture is given by inspiration of God, but it says, and is profitable. And then it goes on to tell us what it's profitable for. First of all, it says it's profitable for doctrine that is teaching teaching us what we need to know about god so it's profitable for doctrine then it says it's profitable profitable for reproof that means one of the works of the word of god is to show us when we've done wrong to reprove us that's one of its important functions the next thing it says it's profitable for correction so not only does it tell us when we've done something wrong but it tells us how to correct it, how to fix what we've done wrong. And then the next thing it's good for, it says, is instruction in righteousness. So it shows us what we've done wrong, shows us how to fix what we've done wrong, and then it shows us how to do right and live right and avoid doing wrong. That's the purpose of God giving us this book. And in the Old Testament, David understood that principle. And that's why he said in Psalm 119, 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so so he counsels us uh, through prayer, through his spirit, through his word. And the fact that he counsels us through the word is another reason why we need to be continually in the word uh, on a daily basis. But then let me give you the last one this morning. And that is he counsels us through his servants, through other believers. God uses many of his servants to counsel and encourage his children. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, uh, Paul shares with us uh, what he felt was his purpose in preaching and teaching other people. He says this, he does it that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so what he's basically saying is that he felt like it was his job as a preacher to be a comforter and to be a counselor uh, concerning the things of God. And that's how God works a lot of ways. A lot of times God uses pastors. He uses teachers. He uses counselors. But he uses other believers in general to counsel and encourage and come alongside of us. And that's another reason why we need to be actively involved in a church family so that we don't miss out on that counsel. So that, uh, so that we have access to God speaking to us through other uh, believers. And so Jesus uses prayer, his spirit, his word, and his servants to counsel and lead us in the right path. Jesus Christ is wonderful and he is the best counselor ever. His name is wonderful, the name above all names, He is our all in all. And that's why we need to go to him for every problem, every concern, every circumstance. You know, Christmas is often a time of need. It's often an emotional and stressful time. Did you know that the day after Christmas 
is the number one day for suicides in our country. People are hurting and lost and looking for an advisor and an advocate. They are looking for real answers. And we have the world's best counselor who's always available and always ready to help. But we can't keep him all to ourselves. We need to tell others that there is help and hope in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. The bottom line is this. Jesus Christ is our wonderful counselor. Now next week, we're going to continue looking at Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 as we focus on the next name for Jesus, and that is the mighty God. And so we invite you to be back here next week and join us once again as we continue this series of Christmas messages on the wonderful names of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God and for the opportunity we've had to open its pages this morning. Thank you, Lord, for being so wonderful. You are a wonderful Savior, and we love you this morning. We stand amazed and astonished and in awe of you and for all the wonderful things you have done in our lives. We're grateful uh, for that this morning. And we thank you for your counsel. We thank you for the way you guide us and direct us and speak to our hearts through prayer and through your word and through your spirit and through other believers. We thank you for the counsel we receive from you through these avenues. And I pray, Lord, that you would always help us to be sensitive to your counsel and open to your counsel and willing to follow your counsel. And then, of course, we pray for anybody who might have heard this message, whether it's here in the church house or by way of the Internet, who do not know in a personal way this wonderful Savior in their heart and life. And I pray that today they'd open up their heart and invite Christ in to be their Savior and Lord. And we ask this in his name. Amen.